crowd and welcome the amazing crew from Hawk City. First off, to start, let's introduce each person, and, and Johnny, I'll let you take the lead on this. Uh, introduce each person and what they do for Haunt Scene. Okay. Uh, hi, my name is Gianni Bronto, and I'm the founder of Haunt Scene. We've been uh, traveling around the country doing spooky bleep for the last, uh, since 2015. So, uh, uh, Kira here is uh, one of our content creators, our photographer. If you see some amazing pictures, there's a good chance that they took it. And uh, uh, Casey here is one of our newest crew members. He is our F around and find out person. So he does the extreme experiences and we go and do paranormal investigation and they're like, don't sit in this 1800 wheelchair. There's a spirit that possesses it. And then Casey's like, yeah. <laughs> uh, we just did that at uh, Dare to Escape a couple weeks ago. So yeah, uh, so yeah that was, see how I, how I segued that together? That was pretty good, <laughs> was you good. got to sit. Yes, yes. Uh, they, they linked intent to action, amazing. Um, uh, so Johnny, tell us first of all, so that everybody gets kind of a, a breadth of it, um, how Haunt Scene started, why it started, and how maybe it's transformed in its arc to where it is today. Okay. Uh, well, we started in 2015. I will be 100% transparent. We were Horror Nights nerds. I know you guys probably, you know, well, done Horror Nights. Was, ah. We started there. Uh, and then uh, a couple years later, I found out that there were a thing called independent haunted attractions. <gasps> and uh, my first one that I went to was the Shallow Grave, which used to be in Winter Haven. RIP, we miss you, Shallow Grave. Uh, and, then, uh, and then a couple years later, I started Haunt Scene, and now we travel all over the country. So our long-term goal is to do one haunt in every state. So far, we're at well over 100 haunts. We've done 20 states. And uh, every year we pick up a couple new states and we try to hit up some new haunts. So my last two states will be Alaska going to Hawaii. <laughs> and then I'll, I'm going to retire and leave it to these fine people. <laughs> I love it. Um, so you know, part of the premise of today is uh, what makes a good haunt, what obstructs a good haunt, what stands in the way, and the five best haunts that they have visited uh, and the travels around the United States. So. You know, I'm I'm in the hunt industry in a different way. Yep. I'm not familiar with any of this. So this spooky adjacent is what yeah. we call it. Oh yes, yeah, they're spooky adjacent. So so tell us what are some of the elements, and this is open to everybody sitting up here. What are some of the elements that to you makes a place a good haunt? Okay. Uh, it all starts with really, I think, the characters. Uh, probably the number one thing that makes a haunt. You can have the most gorgeous haunt, the most beautiful haunt, with the best sets and effects, but if you don't have the people behind it, uh, that will detract from the haunt. Um, I think the people are really what make or break a, a haunt. Uh, and then I'm, I'm a big fan of atmosphere. Uh, I love soundtracks. Mm -hmm. I love lighting. Uh, unfortunately, I've been to a lot of these, and I don't get that scared anymore. I mean, they do get me every once in a while. We're not impervious to that, but but I'm more like, ooh, look at the pretty lights, and look at the amazing, <laughs> oh, it's great. So I'm looking at things a little bit from a from a different viewpoint. What do you think, Kira? Yeah, to dive on the character aspect of what you were saying, um, just having a character that's maybe been in the industry for a while, but they might not have been the dentist in the dentist office for a while. So I think that the haunts that stand out are the ones that give their characters practice mm -hmm. in those rooms for multiple sessions so that they can come up with not three or four different things that they say, but they can Get come out! up with 12 to Play 15 to even 16, 20, 30 things that they can say. So that way, not only is it good for a first time visitor, but it makes it different for repeat mm. customers. Yes. And it makes it different for every single time you walk through. You might see the same characters in the same exact rooms, but the next time you go through, they might say something completely that you weren't even expecting. Or they might be in a different spot, or they might have become more creative with that. Mm -hmm. But the, the lighting and uh, music is also what really gets me. I'm, I'm an artsy person, so the cinematography of a set and a haunt is really good too. But if your characters are great, your haunt can be plywood for all I care. Yeah, <laughs> you make it work. Chris, how about you? My friend, the man who, the danger man, the, the yes. man who courts death. Um, he does. What, what makes a good haunt in your mind? I love the stories behind some of the haunts that they do because it's, it's more of 
it's one thing to just go through a haunted house and be scared, mm -hmm. but it's another when you're going through a story and you're part of that story as you go through. So it's sort of like a pick your own adventure, but they're picking it for you. And it's nice. Like, yeah, nice. Interactive haunts are oh, very fun. Very we love the immersive. <laughs> so define for us, because, okay, so like in the world of theater, interactive has a very wide reaching meaning. Uh, you can have a fully immersive interactive show with the audience involved, and but there's a lot of people who are directors who believe that oh, and go and like sit near an audience member, that's interactive, and no, it's not. You know, so what in your mind is interactive? Okay, I'll take it. Um, <laughs> so I think there are different levels of an interactive haunt. Um, a lot of people call some of them touch haunts, and it's where the actors are given permission by you under consent whether it's a waiver or not so much might be a light touching with a glow stick consent um, uh, in most cases um, and this is where they can actually interact with you and portions of the haunt will take you down a different path mm. you might be separated from your group and you go down a different hallway that has different sets and different people um, we actually did a haunt that was on a riverboat and in this haunt, there was actually sections where they separated us and we actually had to perform many, many escape room puzzles. Huh. So we had to rescue the ship from sinking and we had to rescue a, a, someone that they kidnapped for, to get out of the ship before it sunk and stuff like that. Yep. It, there's different levels mm -hmm. that you can interact. And well, that's full even, immersion by the time you get yeah. to the end yeah. there. Right? Yeah. yeah. I, I like the ability to talk to people, interact with them, and that's my favorite moments. And that's when you're not, when you don't have a predefined script. You say something, you get a response, mm -hmm. and it's off the cuff. Uh, Dan Caro, who used to run the Legends oh, at uh, Palm Town, yeah. uh, I, I I like to make jokes, and he was like step for step with me. And this is in the early days of haunting. That's something I really, really love. Uh, so the ability for characters to communicate back and forth, be witty, uh, you know, not just step on a pedal. It's really making you feel like you are an individual going through a haunt and not just a customer. Yeah. Really. Yeah. That's how about you were saying. Because that adds on to the whole story. Is that, that when they interact with you, they say different things. Like when he says he says a joke and then they off the cuff say mm -hmm. something. It makes you a part of the all around story or story, and so it's like being inside of the movie. Like you go, you watch a scary movie, you're inside the horror. Right. You're more inside, inside of it. You're inside of it. <laughs> yeah. I love that. So, um, talk about the senses a little bit. How some of these haunted houses play with your senses. I know some of them use, you know, we got you know sight, touch, smell, sound. You know, so talk to me about like uh, some of the elements. Like the smell intrigues me because I know that a lot of them use that. Uh, how have you found that to work or not work to their advantage? Uh, so, uh, The Shallow Grave, uh, I'll never forget this, so I went, I did the experience, and uh, I think I went to like Chili's or something later, and I'm like, man, this food doesn't taste right. And, uh, and I, I like, you know, blew my nose, and they have a scent cup, which is what they use in haunted houses, and it was called Slaughterhouse. And this stuff was Famous stuck stuff. in my nose for like hours, and that affects your <laughs> sense of taste. Uh, so I think smells very important, and uh, haunts are really good at this, you know, you go through a... Uh, 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 bakery scene and you can you can smell the bread cooking you can smell the decay whatever it's just uh, there are companies that are dedicated to this in the haunt industry that make a smell for everything obviously poop you know that kind of yeah. stuff vomit we, we did a London like a 19th oh my God. 18th century London scene that smelled we, we, gotta, we gotta name drop these haunts like yeah name drop well, <laughs> so, 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 you were, you were saving so, that for the end so the river <laughs> the riverboat was the USS Nightmare that's in Kentucky uh, the one that she's talking about is the 13th Gate. That one is in Baton Rouge, Baton Rouge uh, New Orleans. But the, it, the, the point area. was, it smelled like urine. Yeah. It smelled like you know people who didn't have jobs were coming around the corner and you know. Well, maybe the scare jobs. actors didn't have jobs, and maybe that was <laughs> that. It might have been real. It might have been a scent maker. Like I'm bourbon, not sure. bourbon Street, authentic. But it, it, authentic it changes scent. your vibe as yeah. soon as you walk in and you get smacked with this sense that gives the overall impression of where you are. Yep. Yeah. I love that. Well, I, 
I mean, I remember going on the original King Kong ride at Universal, mm -hmm. and the first thing that struck me was, this smells like a subway devoid of the urine. Uh, <laughs> you know? So it was a sad, but it still, that got me like that, the minute I smelled that, and it brought me into that idea, so bravo. Yeah. And scent is really important. I mean, if you've get, been to Universal, everybody knows the smell of E.T. Yes. Yeah, oh yeah. Yes. Uh, I mean, we're buying candles of it now. Yes. <laughs> true. I'm wearing the cologne. <laughs> so, so if these are the things that make a good haunt, and you can, we can keep coming back and adding things to it, of course, what stands in the way of something being a successful haunt in your mind? Can we take this one? Yeah, you uh, yeah, This will be in the next three hours, I think. Uh, <laughs> all right, so uh, I, I, I love promoting the haunt industry. Uh, that's what we do. We're out there to make, make these haunts look good. We're like a travel show. Uh, however, uh, there are... There are some haunts that, the thing that really takes me out of the haunt because I want to be immersed is changing gears too fast. Going through a haunt, you're in one room and it's like redneck zombies and the other one's a cult and then all of a sudden you walk in another room and it's 3D clowns. Mm. That's the biggest pet peeve of mine. Uh, and, uh, transitions. Yeah, transitions. Uh, and also not matching the interior of the haunt to the location. A couple of years ago, we did a haunt in Gainesville. Uh, they're not around anymore, so I guess I can talk about them. Uh, but it was a rustic farm, and it was uh, cornfields, and it was you know bales of hay, and everything was dirty, and there were bugs, and it was dusty, dust bowl settings. And then we walk inside, and there were clowns. Yeah. So as you pull up to this thing, you're like, this is gonna be amazing. I can't wait to get murdered by these rednecks or whatever. And then all of a sudden, clowns. So <laughs> clowns have their place because there are people, that's the reason why you see a lot of clowns in haunts is because people have cholerophobia, they're afraid of clowns, come jack the clown, you know. Uh, but for me, clowns are on the other end of the spectrum. They don't, they're, they're, whatever the phobia is, I'm on the other end, they just make me sad and angry. All right. So, unless, uh, unless they're really creative, yeah. different twists on clowns, but 3D clowns. Yeah, 3D, yes, neon clowns. There's a lot of those in the haunted <laughs> street. No offense, we love you, but I'm not scared of you. Um, I think I'm going to go with a sense. Um, a lot of haunts, you, you, I'm sure everybody who's been in here has been in a haunted house, and I'm sure you've heard a really loud noise. And this is something that is an easy scare grab. Um, however, it doesn't need to be everywhere. It doesn't oh, need to be excessive. Yeah. So yes. over you, um, yes. yeah. I personally have a pet peeve with uh, tin drums, those mm. big like wow. sewer drum things that you just yeah, bang so on top of. Wow. And usually when there's one, there's 50 of them. Yep. Um, and you just have four characters just like bah, yeah. bah, bah. It, it is literally <laughs> the more cowbell of the haunt industry. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I, think, I think what sets the part um, a good haunt and a bad haunt is knowing your audience. Mm. So you know what makes you money, you know what makes the scares, but overusing them or skimming them here and there just to make more money or just to get more scares or you think there's more scares. Um, if a group comes in and you make that loud noise and everybody's clearly like, ow, that hurt, yeah. don't do it again. Like, <laughs> just kind of knowing your audience and catering to them not to your pocket or to your ego, I guess. Mm. Yeah, we're, we're not a fan of cash grab haunts. Yeah. yeah. Right. <laughs> um, I was actually going to talk about that, is that overdoing things. Like, I've noticed since wearing haunt scene and stuff, they want to make sure you get the most scary situation as opposed to regular. And it's, sure. sometimes it's overkill, where it's, if you're screaming in my face here, don't scream in my face. Casey, right you gotta yeah. project, <laughs> sir. Oh, I'm so sorry. Project! So sorry. project. <laughs> he does all the to me. crazy stuff, but he's the introvert. Yeah. <laughs> yes, I am. Um, but it's, it's, if you're sitting there and you scream in my face here, like she said with the tin drum, right. it's overdoing that. Yeah. Where it's, okay, this screaming in my face definitely scared me, but if you scream in my face again at the end of the hallway, I'm already deaf, I can't hear you. Right. So it's like, and I feel bad because I'm like, oh, you tried so hard to scare me, but I can't hear. <laughs> it's overdone and overdone. Yes. They're trying to get you in the same way rather than a twist or a different way. Exactly. That's, yeah, that's and spacing that. out the scare. Right. Oh, yes. that's going spacing out the scare. Spacing out the was scare. Was another thing that he said. Yeah, because you don't want a scare, 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 scare. You have to have recovery and then, and then be able to come back yes. up. Yeah, absolutely. The rhythms of it. Yep. Well, talk about that for a second. That's something I never thought about, actually. Mm -hmm. Like I said, this is not my industry. What are the rhythms like as you go through a good haunted house? 
So uh, I think the rhythm is based on the pace because the haunts have a, they have to do throughput, right? They got to get so many people through the haunt or you're waiting in line, you're bumping up against people, that kind of thing. So enough to, enough to stop you every once in a while, but keep you going forward. There's a, there's a term in the haunt industry, it's called scare forward. That way that you're not stopped, you keep going uh, through the haunt. Um, I think one of my pet peeves is when the whatever's happening in the scene doesn't match the space. Like if I walk into a room and there's a cult leader sitting there, I don't have five minutes to listen to his monologue about the world ending. Like, give me the uh, give me the elevator pitch, cult leader. You know, <laughs> you know like, I, I need to keep moving on. And we we don't walk through haunts fast. And we don't walk through haunts slow. We walk through at a nice normal pace. And the things in the haunt should dictate that pace. And uh, the difference between that scare forward and scare backwards is a character coming out and stepping in your bubble of walking path, right. as opposed to stepping either to your side that makes you go sideways and forward, or stepping behind you where you get scared forward. Blocking the pathways is another thing that happens quite often. And if you are a pretty busy haunt and you are trying to get as many people through as possible, because I mean, you, you want to make money, right? <laughs> um, you don't want your lines to be super long. So every time you stop one group for five seconds, three seconds, that three seconds adds up and adds up and adds up and adds up. And, adds up and, you, domino. and yep. by the end of the hour, you could have gotten 30, 40, 50 more people through even with that just like five second right. yeah. stop that you're stopping every other group or so. We've been split up in a hop before too. Yeah. Because yeah. it was like, there's a whole video where they're like, where'd Casey go? Where'd Casey go? And I'm just with him. <laughs> do you like those kind of haunts where you get split up or do you, would you rather be with your group? Uh, I, I think that you go to a haunt with a strength in numbers mentality and yeah. that breaks that. Right. Like if you get separated by yourself, uh, we actually just did Dare to Escape, Plug Plug in Kissimmee. They have like a haunt room, it's called the Seventh Floor. Anybody done that one Seventh yet? Seventh Door. Seventh Door? It's Seventh amazing, door. sorry. Uh, there is a part where one person is isolated, and guess who that person was? Me, and it was terrifying. And this is actually a <laughs> legit haunted escape game in Kissimmee, it's awesome. We have a whole video of it if you want to check so it out. So that's a so plus to you, the idea oh, of yeah. yes. like I isolating think I, you and putting you in that emotional state. I like that, I like that. And nice. Uh, I want to break that down more because yeah, please. that's another like business aspect and I mean Disney does it. What do they do? They want to make memories, right? So when you got isolated, are you going to forget that? Nope. And did we laugh about it for the so entire long? Time. Still laughing. It he was stuck this, in there trying to get to the next thing and I'm like, oh my God. It created <laughs> this memory to where years from now we're going to remember yep. Johnny getting trapped and screaming inside of an isolation chamber. And those are the things that a good haunt will do. You're not just gonna go through and then forget about it a week later. Like I can't right. even remember what that room was that you're talking about because it had nothing significant to make me remember it. Right. Yeah, and, 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 and I'm sorry. A, a good haunt is, you're not gonna remember the details, but you're gonna remember how you felt. What, you know the, the general you know gist of when you did the haunt that's what you're taking with you you know because you know when you get to doing a lot of haunts and we do sometimes multiple in a night they tend to blend together but it's those very specific very unique things that we will remember forever so I'll remember that isolation thing forever it's amazing <laughs> now here's a kind of a, a deeper cultural question this is very interesting so something that you don't know about me Johnny is that when I first came down here I was here uh, I was brought down to work special effects for all the TV shows when we were Hollywood would east. Uh, We're not. That never happened. Moving. Uh, yes. Uh, and then the next year I was hired to make the first special effects and makeups and help direct Terror on Church Street. I used to go to that all the time. There you go. I missed it. Now, one of the elements of Terror on Church Street is that people were touched. That has shifted over the years, obviously, because you talked about the consent form or you yeah. know, giving consent, which is a big topic in theater and in the entertainment industry, right? Giving consent. So talk to us about what some of the ways that we have to give consent now in a haunted house, especially to be touched, okay. that kind of a thing. Well, I mean, I do the uh, police reenactment, so I work scenarios for the police. When I started, they would grab you and throw you to the floor. Now they're not allowed to touch you. Mm. It's really interesting what they do in, in their training scenarios, you know? So talk to me a little bit about that idea of consent for touch. Okay, so a lot of haunts are, make it really easy because it's just an upcharge. Mm -hmm. You pay more money, you get more stuff, you know? 
uh, you're either going to sign a waiver, you're going to get a glow stick, or you're going to get a glow necklace of some kind, or something to mark you as fair game for the, the glow in the dark stamp on the forehead. Something, yeah. Yeah. something that Bunny tells ears. the characters so that they are able to set you apart visually. Right. Um, which you'll be full aware of. Uh, on the back end of this, any haunt that does touch you has to be insured to do so. Um, so if a haunt is not telling you whatsoever about touching you and they do touch you, that's something that you should be bringing up because that's a illegal. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you, you also, if you're wearing a press badge or stuff, they tend to want to touch you more. So people, are, people want to touch me apparently, you know? Well, Johnny, that's, <laughs> I don't know, that's neither here On scene that. after dark. And, yes. and I'd also, um, there are many levels of touch, as I was saying before, there's little shoves, there's like- Redirecting. Like slight grazes, yeah. there's taking you physically to another place. We've also done ones that are a little bit more intense where uh, we were in a butcher scene and two big guys in overalls and pig masks picked me up and put me on a table and were Whoa. pretending to down. hack me into mm. pieces. And we ended up getting kicked out and had to crawl on the floor like pigs. Uh, it was really, really fun. They are actually super fun. They make you feel super safe if they're doing it correctly. Wait, right. there's, there's was it though? That, that was, was, that, that was fun. Safe. All it's this good. terrible stuff, but it was super I, fun. I loved it. Crying. <laughs> like, <laughs> please stop. They took my Get shoes to crawl out, but it was fun. Yeah, in a fun way. <laughs> but no, and then there's um, something that we learned this last year is verbiage in uh, marketing and um, just the advertisements or the menus. A lot of haunts that do these touch experiences, who do just light grazes and light pulls, they'll use the word extreme in their name. And anytime you see the word extreme, you're gonna wanna clarify. Yeah, read, them. Read, read the fine print. Uh, because we've had extreme levels of the word extreme right. <laughs> across the country. Yep. Mm -hmm. And we actually ended up doing an actual extreme haunt, which is a physically borderline violent haunt. Yeah. So um, we didn't had no idea. That one, that one, <laughs> that one kicked our butts. Yeah. It, it, which one was we, that? Do you that was the uh, haunted hotel in Kentucky. Okay. Haunted hotel in Kentucky, and which which was awesome, it, it but was, they kicked our ass. It was awesome, but it was. And when you say kicked your ass, what do you mean? Like what kind uh, of stuff? So hands bound. Uh, I think I, so they, at one point they were like, get on your knees, and I got on my knees. Before I could get on my knees, they one of them hip checked me, and I went down like face first on oh. the ground. So it was, it Hard was uh, yeah, a little, little bit of waterboarding. Yeah, yeah, yeah waterboarding. <laughs> a little, little light waterboarding, you know. <laughs> But uh, it was fun. But it was fun. <laughs> you weren't there. I know. I was great waterboarding, man. He would uh, do it. Uh, that right, one so was a little intense. We that's, actually... that's the case special. Yeah. <laughs> He's like, we'll never expect you to do it, but you're going to do it. So we have about 15 <laughs> minutes left, so that we're going to move on to that last section. What are your top five haunts and why that you have all visited? Uh, I'll, t I'll go first. Okay. So uh, we, in our travels, we try not to put one haunt over another, but this might be the only time we do. Yeah, this. and it's, <laughs> so so. Um, if I was on a desert island, <laughs> and there were it was a spooky desert island, and there was I needed a Mount Rushmore of top five haunts. So I'm gonna frame this. Obviously, Netherworld. How I many you guys been to Netherworld? Netherworld in, in Georgia is amazing. One it's, person. It is the Disney World of Haunts. It is the, it is, it is, it's redonkulous. It is, it will change the way you look at everything. Uh, another thing, uh, the darkness in St. Louis is also amazing. And I got to give that one some love because that was really one of the things that made me fall in love with the haunt industry. Um, I just did this one last year uh, and it, it had a very unique, uh, I had a unique take on it because this was an urban myth when I grew up in, right outside Detroit. So there is one that's called the Eloise Asylum, and it's in Detroit, and it is built upon the grounds and buildings of an actual insane asylum. Oh. And it was amazing. Uh, but I grew up about 15 minutes away from when it was an actual asylum. So uh, so it, it's uh, really a impressive. Bit extra scary a little bit too. extra scary. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, it kind of hit home. Uh, Haunted Overload, Haunted Overload in the Northeast, amazing. Um, I remember walking in and uh, there was a like a 30 foot skeleton reaper guy and I and I uh, when the, the person that was giving us the tour 
uh, I was like, oh wow, this is so cool, man, it's so big. He, he literally says, he's like, yeah, this is like the smallest prop we have. <laughs> like, it is like stories. <laughs> it, you feel like, it is like, honey, I shrunk you in the haunt. You feel like a little ant going through this thing. Haunted Overload's amazing, that's four. Oh my God, oh my God. Uh, this isn't gonna be enough. Uh, let's just say, <laughs> I'm gonna give two more, I'm gonna give two more, uh, a bonus one. So we love the Dent Schoolhouse in Cincinnati, Ohio. Yes. Old school, old school uh, house, amazing. And then uh, Woods of Terror, Woods of Terror is amazing. And I know I'm missing, we've done 120 something haunts. So, and uh, we, the way we look at haunts is we don't, we don't go to like one haunt with like five different houses and say that's five haunts. No, one location's one haunt. Right. So we've been to 127 different locations. Um, but yeah, Woods of Terror, they got 10 sections and you go through the whole thing. Where is that? North that is in Carolina. Uh, North Carolina. Um, Woods of Terror is actually, I think, 10 to 12 full-size yeah. haunts in one trail. Wow. So you actually get into a full Victorian house haunt. You go through the entire haunt like you would a normal haunt. Like, what, 10 minutes, 15 minutes? It's, there, it's nuts. And then you exit that house, and now you're in a boat house. Then it is a completely new haunt, and it is 12 of them. Yeah, it's, it's out really, in really the good. woods. And they have all of the property to themselves. They've hand built everything on it. It mm. is insane. <laughs> um, you didn't mention one that I think oh, man. should Th always, well, 13th always Gate Rise. be on the top. Legends of Fear. Two haunts in Baton Rouge called 13th Gate. The reason why I love 13th Gate so much is because cinematography yes. wise, the lighting, the smells, the actors, the, the ambiance, there are sections where you walk through and you genuinely feel like you are walking through a creaky hallway in a horror movie. You have no idea where things are coming from. The sets are just mind blowing. People flying on, uh, what are those called? Zip uh, lines. Zip lines is insane. Um, and then Rise. Rise um, is in a little farm out in the middle of basically nowhere. Tickfa. 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 Louisiana. Yep. Yep. And um, they have a regular haunt that they built up and it's fantastic, but they also have what we call a theatrical haunt um, where you go in groups of about eight and the, everyone inside has lines and lines and lines of script as well as improv and you are literally a so part good. of the story it's literally going through a horror movie and you are interacted you're you're being pulled into sections to push buttons for the actors to do whatever they're doing and every year they do a new storyline and it adds to the story overall art gang so it's it's mind-blowing yep. I need, I need like a Mount Rushmore. Can I get like 20 more? Uh, maybe. Okay. All right. Uh, if, you go to, if you go to hauntscene.com, you can see the uh, actual list of all the haunts that we've done. So, uh, and the we have a we have. Florida haunt and directory. We, and we do run a Florida haunt directory. Florida. We update it usually in the summer with all the haunts that'll be open that are on our list and then the link to buy tickets in their calendar and all that. So, so please bookmark that website. We'd appreciate it. Very nice. Do you have um, any oh, top yeah. ones that you want to I haven't about? gone out of state with these guys yet, so I haven't yeah. got to all the things that he just mentioned. I've never, <laughs> never seen. <laughs> but I'm like, Sam, like, oh, that does sound cool. Um, so a lot of mine are local. Obviously. Okay. Terror on Church Street was one of my first, and I used to go a lot. I was a kid too. Yeah. Um, that's for the, for the time. How many of you remember Terror on Church Street? Anybody here? Yeah. Well, yeah, a few. For the time period, it was a really good thing. It was in the middle of downtown Orlando in a building that's no longer there. They ripped down the building, uh, bought new uh, built new construction there. And it was originally created by um, a Spanish company. So when I said that, I was kind of like, what, in, as a director? I really wasn't. I didn't speak Spanish at all, so why they chose me, I don't know. But the director would like yell things at me in Spanish and make do things, and I'd be like, I think he's saying he wants you to come out of the closet. And go, I mean, that, that's, that's kind of what I did. It was the strangest thing in the world. Um, but they had wonderful sets, very elaborate. Um, a lot of scare actors. They were famous for their scare actors. You know, mm -hmm. uh, a lot of it was the jump scares. Mm -hmm. I'm gonna, you know, I, I know that. I knew it when I was working on it and stuff. And years later, David Clevenger <coughs> came in. If anybody knows David Clevenger, he's a local uh, theater director, designer, amazing producer, and he rebuilt the whole thing. So he redesigned it and bought a new set. So they bought, uh, that's when Alan Ostrander came in. Uh, they did major special effects and stuff. And it, it, so it really took it to a different plateau. You know, and at the beginning it was right when they were filming Psycho 
27 or something. No, so, uh, so, Tony, so Tony Perkins was here and that's still alive. And Anthony Perkins was the spokesman for Terror on Church Street. So that's kind of how it all started uh, working on that. Yeah. And, and, it, and it was legitimately haunted. Yes. Yeah, I've heard stories about people getting scratched. They had the, the what's buildings called the finger man. Yeah, it's the old so. Woolworths building, and we were in. It was a different department store. I forget. Woolworths was on the corner. This was a different um, old McCrory. I think it was uh, McCrory, something like that. Yep. An old uh, department store. But anyway, I didn't mean to interrupt you. No, but, you're good. But continuing. I would love hearing yeah. about Terror Hunter. Yeah. So, continuing yeah. on with some of your favorites. Uh, some other local haunts are my favorite. Is obviously uh, newer one is Tales of Terror. Just recently uh, ended, they did a, not ended, they just did a leprechaun haunt, so a St. Patrick Day haunt, which is awesome. really awesome. Tales of Terror is in their first year. First. It is a female owned haunt, which is <laughs> not, very the world. Old, not very old. Where's it located? Where's, where is that? Um, they were in the Warriors paint, Park. The Warriors Park paintball field. By the fairgrounds. Uh, by oh. the fairgrounds. However, they are going to be announcing, I believe, a new They're and moving. exciting location. Yes. Um, but for a first year haunt, we were impressed. It's really good. Very good. Nice. Yes. Very good. Nice. Also, Sir Henry's, always want to point out, Sir Henry's is always fun. That's in Plant City, Florida, if you haven't been to Sir Henry's. That uh, they have the Halloween one, Christmas one, and a Valentine's Day haunt. What do you think of that? I mean, because like, like, that's something that I do all the time, is I create mm -hmm. new holidays to do my horror shows in. Well, this is only, this is recent, that, yes. that Haunted Houses started expanding to Christmas, expanding to Valentine's Day, expanding to, you know, St. Patrick's Day. That was a new one for me. Easter, that was fascinating. Easter. Please, please don't do Easter. Don't do Easter, please. <laughs> Armor <laughs> Day. Yes. Flag Day. Let's not go to Boxing Day. <laughs> um, but, but how does that work and how do you feel about that, that expansion? I love it. I love yeah. it. I, I love it because, uh, well, well, I'll give a shout out to Mortar Manor. Mortar Manor at Old Town is open year round. Um, which you can scratch that itch whenever you want. Uh, but it is so nice to have a uh, full-on haunted attraction experience that is themed for a specific event. So uh, there are haunts around here that do that. Uh, 13th floor in Jacksonville does some themed events throughout the year. Sir Henry's does some themed events. Uh, so you just have to kind of keep an eye on things, but I, I absolutely love it. I think it's awesome. I mean, what's more romantic on Valentine's Day than hearing your love scream for their life in chainsaws? Yeah, well, that's, that's <laughs> how I spend most of mine. <laughs> Joe, real fast, we only have a few minutes left. Questions from you for the crew here. Oh, wow, look at all those hands. Right over here. Uh, forgive me, I know you all just do this, but um, what would you say would be the most cinematic uh, haunted attraction here in Oh, nice. We're all oh. looking at you. Do you see that, everybody? Um, it's cinematic. I'm going to use that that word. We did a haunt. It is on the east side, over by Merritt Island. It's called Screamland, and it is literally. It looks like a decommissioned art museum. It is an immersive experience. It was. I think it, from a cinematic standpoint, it's not jump scares and chainsaws and blood, but just being a part of the experience. It was awesome. Theatrical I, on a horror base. Yeah. Kind of interactive. Yes. Yeah. Uh, Vault of Souls in Tampa is also another one. Scott Swinson runs that. It's really, really good. The Vault of Souls. That's another immersive uh, experience. That is a like a seemingly high class in an actual haunted like yep. 18th it, it, century It's, it's a night out. Vault, it's, yeah. And it's got escape game interactive features to it. Yeah, nice. Uh, that one is uh, definitely yeah. cinematic. Um, um, I do have to move on to one more question. I'm sorry to stop you because we only got like two minutes left. There were other hands here. I'm going to go through that's probably our last question. Go for it. So, you talk about like the haunts that have like obviously those long lines. How do you think it works where if, if you're that person that sees all of it and never really experiences it, what's that juxtaposition? Of oh. oh, you mean like the conga lines? Exactly. Okay, so we're not a fan. Um, you <laughs> lose something because your experience is completely at random. Are you going to get scared or are you not going to get scared? As a person, in, and I have the bad luck where things are always happening way in front of me or way behind me. I'm like, that was that would have been great to see that. Uh, I am not a fan, uh, but with Horror Night specifically, there's, that's the only way they can do it. Unless they sell like a premium express experience or build 20 houses or something like that, the crowds there are like literally the Megacon crowds. Like it's, you have to do that to get the people through. Like the express pass isn't even good enough. Anymore. And I think that comes back into that decision making on making more money. Do you space out groups with one to two seconds in between 
so that way they enter the haunt with a little bit of a gap. Um, Mortem Manor is famous for it over in Kissimmee, the all year round haunt. They only put you in with your group and they have a pre-show that's two minutes long. So each group is two minutes apart. Now it is a smaller haunt, so that was a decision that they made and I think it benefits them because they've been successful. Mortem Manor took over in 2016 and they are still there, yep. unlike the previous owners. So it's all, I think it all comes down to what's the type of experience you want your guests to have. All right. Well, that's just hang out, hang out, we'll answer your question, we'll hang out. Yeah. Uh, one more question, we want to try? Yes. Can we? Okay. One more quick, question, quick. let's do it. Yeah. you're gonna get. Yeah, you, you gotta you just gotta shop around, ask around, go to Hansi.com. Hansi.com. <laughs> everybody. Round of applause. Thank you. Thank you everyone. We're gonna get ready for we have shows at one, two, and three. So be ready for those. Go on out of here. All right. <laughs>